Plutarch, Greek, Plauterchos, Plutarchos, Coin Greek, Plastarch OS, c. 46 AD–120 AD, later named, upon becoming a Roman citizen, Lucius Mestrius Plutarchus, Lucios Maestrios Plauterchos was a Greek biographer and essayist, known primarily for his parallel lives and moralia. He is classified as a Middle Platonist. Plutarch's surviving works were written in Greek, but intended for both Greek and Roman readers. Life Early life Plutarch was born to a prominent family in the small town of Chaeronea, about 80 kilometres east of Delphi, in the Greek region of Boeotia. His family was wealthy. The name of Plutarch's father has not been preserved, but based on the common Greek custom of repeating a name in alternate generations, it was probably Nicarchus and Ikerch o Sigma. The name of Plutarch's grandfather was Lamprias, as he attested in Moralia and in his life of Antony. His brothers, Timon and Lamprias, are frequently mentioned in his essays and dialogues, which speak of Timon in particular in the most affectionate terms. Rualdis, in his 1624 work Life of Plutarchus, recovered the name of Plutarch's wife, Timoxena, from internal evidence afforded by his writings. A letter is still extant, addressed by Plutarch to his wife, bidding her not to grieve too much at the death of their two-year-old daughter, who was named Timoxena after her mother. He hinted at a belief in reincarnation in that letter of consolation. The exact number of his sons is not certain, although two of them, Autobulus and the second Plutarch, are often mentioned. Plutarch's treatise De Anime Procreation in Timaio is dedicated to them, and the marriage of his son Autobulus is the occasion of one of the dinner parties recorded in the table talk. Another person, Soclaris, is spoken of in terms which seem to imply that he was Plutarch's son, but this is nowhere definitely stated. His treatise on marriage questions, addressed to Eurydice and Polyanus, seems to speak of her as having been recently an inmate of his house, but without any clear evidence on whether she was his daughter or not. Plutarch studied mathematics and philosophy at the Academy of Athens under Ammonius from 66 to 67. At some point, Plutarch took Roman citizenship. As evidenced by his new name, Lucius Mestrius Plutarchus, his sponsor for citizenship was Lucius Mestrius Florus, a Roman of consular status whom Plutarch also used as a historical source for his life of Otho. He lived most of his life at Chaeronea, and was initiated into the mysteries of the Greek god Apollo. For many years Plutarch served as one of the two priests at the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, the site of the famous Delphic Oracle, 20 miles from his home. By his writings and lectures Plutarch became a celebrity in the Roman Empire, yet he continued to reside where he was born, and actively participated in local affairs, even serving as mayor. At his country estate, guests from all over the empire congregated for serious conversation, presided over by Plutarch in his marble chair. Many of these dialogues were recorded and published, and the 78 essays and other works which have survived are now known collectively as the Moralia. Topic. Work as magistrate and ambassador In addition to his duties as a priest of the Delphic Temple, Plutarch was also a magistrate at Chaeronea and he represented his home on various missions to foreign countries during his early adult years. Plutarch held the office of Archon in his native municipality, probably only an annual one which he likely served more than once. He busied himself with all the little matters of the town and undertook the humblest of duties. The Suda, a medieval Greek encyclopedia, states that Emperor Trajan made Plutarch procurator of Illyria. However, most historians consider this unlikely, since Illyria was not a procuratorial province, and Plutarch probably did not speak Illyrian. According to the 8th, 9th century historian George Syncellus, late in Plutarch's life, Emperor Hadrian appointed him nominal procurator of Achaia, which entitled him to wear the vestments and ornaments of a consul. Topic. Late period, priest at Delphi Plutarch spent the last thirty years of his life serving as a priest in Delphi. He thus connected part of his literary work with the sanctuary of Apollo, the processes of oracle giving and the personalities who lived or traveled there. One of his most important works is the Why Pythia Does Not Give Oracles in Verse. Moralia 11. Peri tu mi cron emetra nin ten Pythian. Even more important is the dialogue, on the E in Delphi, peri tu a tu en Delphoi, 
which features Ammonius, a Platonic philosopher and teacher of Plutarch, and Lambrius, Plutarch's brother. According to Ammonius, the letter E written on the Temple of Apollo in Delphi originated from the following fact, the wise men of antiquity, whose maxims were also written on the walls of the vestibule of the temple, were not seven but actually five, Chilon, Solon, Thales, Bias and Pitikos. However, the tyrants Cleobulos and Periandros used their political power in order to be incorporated in the list. Thus, the E, which corresponds to number 5, constituted an acknowledgement that the Delphic maxims actually originated from the five real wise men. The portrait of a philosopher exhibited at the exit of the Archaeological Museum of Delphi, dating to the 2nd century AD, had been in the past identified with Plutarch. The man, although bearded, is depicted at a relatively young age. His hair and beard are rendered in coarse volumes and thin incisions. The gaze is deep, due to the heavy eyelids and the incised pupils. The portrait is no longer thought to represent Plutarch. Next to this portrait stands a fragmentary Hermaic steel, bearing a portrait probably of the author from Chaeronea and priest in Delphi. Its inscription, however, reads, Delphoi cherwanusen homu plauterchen ethekan twa amphictyonon dogmasi pithominoi sil.3843 equals sid 4, number 151. The citizens of Delphi and Chaeronea dedicated this to Plutarch together, following the precepts of the Amphictyony. Works Lives of the Roman emperors Plutarch's first biographical works were the lives of the Roman emperors from Augustus to Vitellius. Of these, only the lives of Galba and Otho survive. The lives of Tiberius and Nero are extant only as fragments, provided by Damasius Life of Tiberius, cf. His Life of Isidore and Plutarch himself Life of Nero, cf. Galba 2.1, respectively. These early emperors' biographies were probably published under the Flavian dynasty or during the reign of Nerva AD 96-98. There is reason to believe that the two lives still extant, those of Galba and Otho, ought to be considered as a single work. Therefore, they do not form a part of the Plutarchian canon of single biographies, as represented by the life of Aratus of Sicyon and the life of Artaxerxes II. The biographies of Hesiod, Pindar, Crates, and Diphantus were lost. Unlike in these biographies, in Galba Otho the individual characters of the persons portrayed are not depicted for their own sake but instead serve as an illustration of an abstract principle, namely the adherence or non adherence to Plutarch's morally founded ideal of governing as a princeps. Cf. Galba 1.3, Moralia 328 DE, arguing from the perspective of Platonic political philosophy cf. Republic 375 E, 410 DE, 411 E 412A, 442 BC, in Galba Otho Plutarch reveals the constitutional principles of the Principate in the time of the civil war after Nero's death. While morally questioning the behavior of the autocrats, he also gives an impression of their tragic destinies, ruthlessly competing for the throne and finally destroying each other. The Caesar's house in Rome, the Palladium, received in a shorter space of time no less than four emperors. Plutarch writes, passing, as it were, across the stage, and one making room for another to enter. Galba I, Galba Otho was handed down through different channels. It can be found in the appendix to Plutarch's Parallel Lives as well as in various Moralia manuscripts, most prominently in Maximus Planeta's edition where Galba and Otho appear as Opera 25 and 26. Thus it seems reasonable to maintain that Galba Otho was from early on considered as an illustration of a moral-ethical approach, possibly even by Plutarch himself. Topic. Parallel lives Plutarch's best-known work is The Parallel Lives, a series of biographies of famous Greeks and Romans, arranged in pairs to illuminate their common moral virtues and vices. The surviving lives contain 23 pairs, each with one Greek life and one Roman life, as well as four unpaired single lives. As is explained in the opening paragraph of his Life of Alexander, Plutarch was not concerned with history so much as the influence of character, good or bad, on the lives and destinies of men. Whereas sometimes he barely touched on epic-making events, he devoted much space to charming anecdote and incidental triviality, reasoning that this often said far more for his subjects than even their most famous accomplishments. 
He sought to provide rounded portraits, likening his craft to that of a painter. Indeed, he went to tremendous lengths, often leading to tenuous comparisons, to draw parallels between physical appearance and moral character. In many ways, he must be counted amongst the earliest moral philosophers. Some of the lives, such as those of Heracles, Philip II of Macedon, Epaminondas and Scipio Africanus, no longer exist, many of the remaining lives are truncated, contain obvious lacunae or have been tampered with by later writers. Extant lives include those on Solon, Themistocles, Aristides, Agesilaus II, Pericles, Alcibiades, Nicias, Demosthenes, Pelopidas, Philippoamen, Timoleon, Dion of Syracuse, Eumenes, Alexander the Great, Pyrrhus of Epirus, Romulus, Numa Pompilius, Coriolanus, Theseus, Aemilius Paulus, Tiberius Gracchus, Gaius Gracchus, Gaius Marius, Sulla, Sertorius, Lucullus, Pompey, Julius Caesar, Cicero, Cato the Elder, Mark Antony, and Marcus Junius. Brutus. Topic. Spartan lives and sayings Since Spartans wrote no history prior to the Hellenistic period, and since their only extant literature is fragments of 7th century lyrics, Plutarch's Five Spartan Lives and Sayings of Spartans and Sayings of Spartan Women, rooted in sources that have since disappeared, are one of the richest sources for historians of Lacedaemonia. But while they are important, they are also controversial. Plutarch lived centuries after the Sparta he writes about and a full millennium separates him from the earliest events he records and even though he visited Sparta, many of the ancient customs he reports had been long abandoned, so he never actually saw what he wrote. Plutarch's sources themselves can be problematic. As the historians Sarah Pomeroy, Stanley Burstein, Walter Donlin, and Jennifer Tolbert Roberts have written, Plutarch was influenced by histories written after the decline of Sparta and marked by nostalgia for a happier past, real or imagined. Turning to Plutarch himself, they write. The admiration writers like Plutarch and Xenophon felt for Spartan society led them to exaggerate its monolithic nature, minimizing departures from ideals of equality and obscuring patterns of historical change. Quote, Thus the Spartan egalitarianism and superhuman immunity to pain that have seized the popular imagination are likely myths, and their main architect is Plutarch. While flawed, Plutarch is nonetheless indispensable as one of the only ancient sources of information on Spartan life. Pomeroy et al. conclude that Plutarch's works on Sparta, while they must be treated with skepticism, remain valuable for their large quantities of information. And these historians concede that Plutarch's writings on Sparta, more than those of any other ancient author, have shaped later views of Sparta, despite their potential to misinform. Topic: <laughs> Life of Alexander. Plutarch's Life of Alexander, written as a parallel to that of Julius Caesar, is one of only five extant tertiary sources on the Macedonian conqueror Alexander the Great. It includes anecdotes and descriptions of events that appear in no other source, just as Plutarch's portrait of Numa Pompilius, the putative second king of Rome, holds much that is unique on the early Roman calendar. Plutarch devotes a great deal of space to Alexander's drive and desire, and strives to determine how much of it was presaged in his youth. He also draws extensively on the work of Lysippus, Alexander's favorite sculptor, to provide what is probably the fullest and most accurate description of the conqueror's physical appearance. When it comes to his character, Plutarch emphasizes his unusual degree of self-control. As the narrative progresses, however, the subject incurs less admiration from his biographer and the deeds that it recounts become less savory. The murder of Clytus the Black, which Alexander instantly and deeply regretted, is commonly cited to this end. Much, too, is made of Alexander's scorn for luxury. He desired not pleasure or wealth, but only excellence and glory. This is mostly true, for Alexander's tastes grew more extravagant as he grew older only in the last year of his life and only as a means of approaching the image of a ruler his Persian subjects were better accustomed to thus making it easier for him to succeed in uniting the Greek and Persian worlds together, according to the plan he had announced in his famous speech given in Opus in 324 BC. Topic. Life of Caesar Together with Suetonius's The Twelve Caesars, and Caesar's own works De Bello Gallico and De Bello Civili, this life is the main account of Julius Caesar's feats by ancient historians. Plutarch starts by telling the audacity of Caesar and his refusal to dismiss Cinna's daughter, Cornelia. 
Other important parts are these containing his military deeds, accounts of battles and Caesar's capacity of inspiring the soldiers. His soldiers showed such goodwill and zeal in his service that those who in their previous campaigns had been in no way superior to others were invincible and irresistible in confronting every danger to enhance Caesar's fame. Such a man, for instance, was Asilius, who, in the sea fight at Massalia, boarded a hostile ship and had his right hand cut off with a sword, but clung with the other hand to his shield, and dashing it into the faces of his foes, routed them all and got possession of the vessel. Such a man, again, was Cassius Siva, who, in the battle at Duraceum, had his eye struck out with an arrow, his shoulder transfixed with one javelin and his thigh with another, and received on his shield the blows of 130 missiles. In this plight, he called the enemy to him as though he would surrender. Two of them, accordingly, coming up, he lopped off the shoulder of one with his sword, smote the other in the face and put him to flight, and came off safely himself with the aid of his comrades. Again, in Britain, when the enemy had fallen upon the foremost centurions, who had plunged into a watery marsh, a soldier, while Caesar in person was watching the battle, dashed into the midst of the fight, displayed many conspicuous deeds of daring, and rescued the centurions, after the barbarians had been routed. Then he himself, making his way with difficulty after all the rest, plunged into the muddy current, and at last, without his shield, partly swimming and partly wading, got across. Caesar and his company were amazed and came to meet the soldier with cries of joy, but he, in great dejection, and with a burst of tears, cast himself at Caesar's feet, begging pardon for the loss of his shield. Again, in Africa, Scipio captured a ship of Caesar's in which Granius Petro, who had been appointed quaestor, was sailing. Of the rest of the passengers Scipio made booty, but told the quaestor that he offered him his life. Granius, however, remarking that it was the custom with Caesar's soldiers not to receive but to offer mercy, killed himself with a blow of his sword. However, this life shows few differences between Suetonius' work and Caesar's own works see De Bello Gallico and De Bello Civili. Sometimes, Plutarch quotes directly from the De Bello Gallico and even tells us of the moments when Caesar was dictating his works. In the final part of this life, Plutarch counts Caesar's assassination, and several details. The book ends on telling the destiny of his murderers, and says that Caesar's great guardian genius avenged him after life. Topic. Life of Pyrrhus Plutarch's Life of Pyrrhus is a key text because it is the main historical account on Roman history for the period from 293 to 264 BC, for which neither Dionysus nor Livy have surviving texts. Topic. Criticism of parallel lives Plutarch stretches and occasionally fabricates the similarities between famous Greeks and Romans in order to be able to write their biographies as parallel. The lives of Nicias and Crassus, for example, have little in common except that, "...both were rich and both suffered great military defeats at the ends of their lives." In his Life of Pompey, Plutarch praises Pompey's trustworthy character and tactful behavior in order to conjure a moral judgment that opposes most historical accounts. Plutarch delivers anecdotes with moral points, rather than in-depth comparative analyses of the causes of the fall of the Achaemenid Empire and the Roman Republic, and tends on occasion to fit facts to hypotheses. On the other hand, he generally sets out his moral anecdotes in chronological order unlike, say, his Roman contemporary Suetonius and is rarely narrow-minded and unrealistic, almost always prepared to acknowledge the complexity of the human condition where moralizing cannot explain it. Moralia The remainder of Plutarch's surviving work is collected under the title of the Moralia loosely translated as Customs and Mores. It is an eclectic collection of 78 essays and transcribed speeches, including on fraternal affection. A discourse on honor and affection of siblings toward each other, on the fortune or the virtue of Alexander the Great. An important adjunct to his life of the great king, on the worship of Isis and Osiris a crucial source of information on Egyptian religious rites, along with more philosophical treatises, such as on the decline of the oracles, on the delays of the divine vengeance, on peace of mind and lighter fare, such as Odysseus and Gryllus, a humorous dialogue between Homer's Odysseus and one of Circe's enchanted pigs. The Moralia was composed first, while writing the lives occupied much of the last two decades of Plutarch's own life. Topic. Questions 
Book IV of the Moralia contains the Roman and Greek questions ADI Romaikai and ADI Helenon. The customs of Romans and Greeks are illuminated in little essays that pose questions such as why were patricians not permitted to live on the Capitoline, number 91, and then suggests answers to them. Topic: <laughs> On the Malice of Herodotus. In On the Malice of Herodotus Plutarch criticizes the historian Herodotus for all manner of prejudice and misrepresentation. It has been called the first instance in literature of the slashing review." The 19th-century English historian George Grote considered this essay a serious attack upon the works of Herodotus, and speaks of the "...honorable frankness which Plutarch calls his malignity." Plutarch makes some palpable hits, catching Herodotus out in various errors, but it is also probable that it was merely a rhetorical exercise, in which Plutarch plays devil's advocate to see what could be said against so favorite and well-known a writer. According to Plutarch scholar R. H. Barrow, Herodotus' real failing in Plutarch's eyes was to advance any criticism at all of those states that saved Greece from Persia. Plutarch, he concluded, is fanatically biased in favor of the Greek cities, they can do no wrong. Topic. Other works Symposiacs, Symposiaca Convivium Septem Sapientium Topic. Lost works The Romans loved the lives, and enough copies were written out over the centuries so that a copy of most of the lives has survived to the present day. An ancient list of works attributed to Plutarch, the Catalogue of Lampryas contains 227 works, of which 78 have come down to us. The lost works of Plutarch are determined by references in his own texts to them and from other authors' references over time. There are traces of twelve more lives that are now lost. Plutarch's general procedure for the lives was to write the life of a prominent Greek, then cast about for a suitable Roman parallel, and end with a brief comparison of the Greek and Roman lives. Currently, only 19 of the parallel lives end with a comparison, while possibly they all did at one time. Also missing are many of his lives which appear in a list of his writings, those of Hercules, the first pair of parallel lives, Scipio Africanus and Epaminondas, and the companions to the four solo biographies. Even the lives of such important figures as Augustus, Claudius and Nero have not been found and may be lost forever. Other lost works include whether one who suspends judgment on everything is condemned to inaction, on Pyrrho's ten modes, and on the difference between the Peronians and the academics. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Philosophy. Plutarch was a Platonist, but was open to the influence of the Peripatetics, and in some details even to Stoicism, despite his criticism of their principles. He rejected only Epicureanism absolutely. He attached little importance to theoretical questions and doubted the possibility of ever solving them. He was more interested in moral and religious questions. In opposition to Stoic materialism and Epicurean atheism, he cherished a pure idea of God that was more in accordance with Plato. He adopted a second principle dyad in order to explain the phenomenal world. This principle he sought, however, not in any indeterminate matter but in the evil world soul which has from the beginning been bound up with matter, but in the creation was filled with reason and arranged by it. Thus it was transformed into the divine soul of the world, but continued to operate as the source of all evil. He elevated God above the finite world, and thus demons became for him agents of God's influence on the world. He strongly defends freedom of the will, and the immortality of the soul. Platonic peripatetic ethics were upheld by Plutarch against the opposing theories of the Stoics and Epicureans. The most characteristic feature of Plutarch's ethics is, however, its close connection with religion. However pure Plutarch's idea of God is, and however vivid his description of the vice and corruption which superstition causes, his warm religious feelings and his distrust of human powers of knowledge led him to believe that God comes to our aid by direct revelations, which we perceive the more clearly the more completely that we refrain in enthusiasm. From all action, this made it possible for him to justify popular belief in divination in the way which had long been usual among the Stoics. His attitude to popular religion was similar. The gods of different peoples are merely different names for one and the same divine being and the powers that serve it. The myths contain philosophical truths which can be interpreted allegorically. 
Thus Plutarch sought to combine the philosophical and religious conception of things and to remain as close as possible to tradition. Influence Plutarch's writings had an enormous influence on English and French literature. Shakespeare paraphrased parts of Thomas North's translation of Selected Lives in his plays, and occasionally quoted from them verbatim. Jean Jacques Rousseau quotes from Plutarch in the 1762 Emile, or On Education, a treatise on the education of the whole person for citizenship. Rousseau introduces a passage from Plutarch in support of his position against eating meat. You ask me, said Plutarch, why Pythagoras abstained from eating the flesh of beasts. Ralph Waldo Emerson and the Transcendentalists were greatly influenced by the Moralia and in his glowing introduction to the five-volume, 19th-century edition, he called the lives, a Bible for heroes. He also opined that it was impossible to read Plutarch without a tingling of the blood, and I accept the saying of the Chinese Mencius, a sage is the instructor of a hundred ages. When the manners of Lu are heard of, the stupid become intelligent, and the wavering, determined. Montaigne's essays draw extensively on Plutarch's Moralia and are consciously modeled on the Greeks' easy-going and discursive inquiries into science, manners, customs and beliefs. Essays contains more than 400 references to Plutarch and his works. James Boswell quoted Plutarch on writing lives, rather than biographies, in the introduction to his own life of Samuel Johnson. Other admirers included Ben Jonson, John Dryden, Alexander Hamilton, John Milton, Louis L'Amour, and Francis Bacon, as well as such disparate figures as Cotton Mather and Robert Browning. Plutarch's influence declined in the 19th and 20th centuries, but it remains embedded in the popular ideas of Greek and Roman history. One of his most famous quotes was one that he included in one of his earliest works. The world of man is best captured through the lives of the men who created history. Translations of Lives and Moralia There are translations, from the original Greek, in Latin, English, French, German, Italian, Polish and Hebrew. One advantage to a modern reader who is not well acquainted with Greek is, that being but a moderate stylist, Plutarch is almost as good in a translation as in the original. French translations. Jacques Amiot's translations brought Plutarch's works to Western Europe. He went to Italy and studied the Vatican text of Plutarch, from which he published a French translation of the Lives in 1559 and Moralia in 1572, which were widely read by educated Europe. Amiot's translations had as deep an impression in England as France, because Thomas North later published his English translation of the Lives in 1579 based on Amiot's French translation instead of the original Greek. Topic. English translations Plutarch's Lives were translated into English, from Amiot's version, by Sir Thomas North in 1579. The complete Moralia was first translated into English from the original Greek by Philemon Holland in 1603. In 1683, John Dryden began a life of Plutarch and oversaw a translation of the Lives by several hands and based on the original Greek. This translation has been reworked and revised several times, most recently in the 19th century by the English poet and classicist Arthur Hugh Clough, first published in 1859. One contemporary publisher of this version is Modern Library. Another is Encyclopædia Britannica in association with the University of Chicago, ISBN 0 85229 163 9, copyright 1952, Library of Congress catalog card number 5510323. In 1770, English brothers John and William Langhorne published, Plutarch's Lives from the Original Greek, with Notes Critical and Historical, and A New Life of Plutarch in six volumes and dedicated to Lord Folkestone. Their translation was re-edited by Archdeacon Wrangham in the year 1819. From 1901 to 1912, an American classicist, Bernadotte Perrin, produced a new translation of the Lives for the Loeb Classical Library. The Moralia is also included in the Loeb series, translated by various authors. 
Penguin Classics began a series of translations by various scholars in 1958 with the fall of the Roman Republic, which contained six lives and was translated by Rex Warner. Penguin continues to revise the volumes. Topic: <laughs> Italian translations. Note: Just main translations from the second half of 15th century. Battista Alessandro Iaconelli, Vite di Plutarco Traducto Latino in Vulgar in Aquila, L'Aquila, 1482. Dario Taberti, La Vite di Plutarco Rito in Compendio, per M. Dario Taberto da Cesena, e Tradot alla Commune Utilita di Chasuno per El Fauno, in Bona Lingua Vulgare, Venice, 1543. Lodovico Dominici, Vite di Plutarco. Tradot da M. Lodovico Dominici, con gli suoi sommari posti dinanzi a Chasuna Vita Venice, 1560. Francesco Sansovino, La Vite de gli uomini illustri greci e romani, di Plutarco Cerenio Samo Filosofo et Historica, Tradat Nuovamente da M. Francesco Sansovino Venice, 1564. Marcello Adriani il Giovanni, Opuscoli Morali di Plutarco Volgarizzati da Marcello Adriani il Giovanni, Florence, 1819–1820. Girolamo Pompei, La Vite di Plutarco, Verona, 1772–1773. Latin translations There are multiple translations of parallel lives into Latin, most notably the one titled, Pour la Dauphin, French for, For the Prince, written by a scribe in the court of Louis XV of France and a 1470 Ulrich Hahn translation. <laughs> German translations Hieronymus <laughs> Emser In 1519, Hieronymus Emser translated De Capienda ex Animicus Utilitate We Ym Einer Seinen Vaint Nuts Machen Kahn, Leipzig. <laughs> Gottlob Benedict von Chirac The biographies were translated by Gottlob Benedict von Chirac and printed in Vienna by Franz Haas, 1776–80. Johann Friedrich Solomon Kaltwasser Plutarch's Lives and Moralia were translated into German by Johann Friedrich Solomon Kaltwasser Vitae Parallelli. Vergleichend Lebensbeschreibungen. 10 Bande. Magdeburg 1799–1806. Moralia. Moralische Abhandlungen. 9 BDE. Frankfurt A. M. 1783–1800. Topic. Subsequent German translations Biographies Konrad Ziegler HRSG, Gro Griechen und Romer. 6 BDE, Zurich 1954–1965, Bibliothek der Alten Welt. Moralia Konrad Ziegler HRSG, Plutarch. Über Gott und Vorshung, Damonen und Weissagung, Zurich 1952. Bibliothek der Alten Welt Bruno Snell HRSG, Plutarch. Von der Rue des Gemets und an der Schriften, Zurich 1948. Bibliothek der Alten Welt Hans Joseph Klauck HRSG, Plutarch. Moralphilosophische Schriften, Stuttgart 1997. Reclams Universal Bibliothek Herwig Gorgmans HRSG, Plutarch. Dry Religions Philosophische Schriften, Dusseldorf 2003. Topic: <inaudible> Hebrew translations Following some Hebrew translations of selections from Plutarch's Parallel Lives published in the 1920s and the 1940s, a complete translation was published in three volumes by the Bialik Institute in 1954, 1971 and 1973. 
The first volume, Roman Lives, first published in 1954, presents the translations of Joseph G. Liebes to the biographies of Coriolanus, Fabius Maximus, Tiberius Gracchus and Gaius Gracchus, Cato the Elder and Cato the Younger, Gaius Marius, Sulla, Sertorius, Lucullus, Pompey, Crassus, Cicero, Julius Caesar, Brutus and Mark Anthony. The second volume, Greek Lives, first published in 1971 presents A. A. Halevi's translations of the biographies of Lycurgus, Aristides, Simon, Pericles, Nicias, Lysander, Agesilaus, Pelopidas, Dion, Timoleon, Demosthenes, Alexander the Great, Eumenes and Phocian. Three more biographies presented in this volume, those of Solon, Themistocles and Alcibiades were translated by M. H. Ben Shammai. The third volume, Greek and Roman Lives, published in 1973, presented the remaining biographies and parallels as translated by Halevi. Included are the biographies of Demetrius, Pyrrhus, Agis and Cleomenes, Aratus and Artaxerxes, Philippoamen, Camillus, Marcellus, Flamininus, Aemilius Paulus, Galba and Otho, Theseus, Romulus, Numa Pompilius and Poplicola. It completes the translation of the known remaining biographies. In the introduction to the third volume Halevi explains that originally the Bialik Institute intended to publish only a selection of biographies, leaving out mythological figures and biographies that had no parallels. Thus, to match the first volume in scope the second volume followed the same path and the third volume was required. Pseudo-Plutarch Some editions of the Moralia include several works now known to have been falsely attributed to Plutarch. Among these are The Lives of the Ten Orators, a series of biographies of the Attic orators based on Cecilius of Calact, on the opinions of the philosophers, on fate, and on music. These works are all attributed to a single, unknown author, referred to as Pseudo-Plutarch. Pseudo-Plutarch lived sometime between the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. Despite being falsely attributed, the works are still considered to possess historical value. Topic see also Middle Platonism Numenius of Apamea Topic Notes Topic References Topic Sources Blackburn, Simon 1994. Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy. Oxford, Oxford University Press. Russell, D. A. 1971-1972. Plutarch. Duckworth Publishing. ISBN 978-1-85399-620-7. Duff, Timothy 2002 Plutarch's Lives, Exploring Virtue and Vice. UK, Oxford University Press. ISBN 978-0-19-925274-9. Hamilton, Edith The Echo of Greece. W. W. Norton and Company. p. 194. ISBN 0-393-00231-4. Honigman, E. A. J. Shakespeare's Plutarch, Shakespeare Quarterly, 1959-25-33. Pelling, Christopher, Plutarch and History. 18 Studies, London 2002. Wardman, Allen, 1974. Plutarch's Lives. Ellick. p. 274. ISBN 0-236-17622-6. John M. Dillon, The Middle Platonists, 80 BC to AD 220, Cornell University Press, 1996 ISBN 978-0801483165 Topic Further reading Beck, Mark, 2000. Anecdote and the Representation of Plutarch's Ethos, in Rhetorical Theory and Praxis in Plutarch, Acta of the Fourth International Congress of the International Plutarch Society, Leuven, July 3-6, 1996. Edited by Luc van der Stocht, 15-32. Collection de Etudes Classiques 11. Leuven, Belgium, Peters. Ed. 2014. A Companion to Plutarch. Blackwell Companions to the Ancient World. Malden, M.A., and Oxford, Blackwell. Benneker, Geoffrey, 2012. The Passionate Statesman, Eros and Politics in Plutarch's Lives. Oxford, Oxford Univ. Press. Duff, Timothy E. 1999. Plutarch's Lives, Exploring Virtues and Vice. Oxford, Oxford Univ. Press. Georgiadou, Aristula, 1992. Idealistic and Realistic Portraiture in the Lives of Plutarch. In Aufstieg und Niedergang der Romischen Welt, Geschichte und Kultur Roms im Spiegel der Neueren Forschung. Volume 2.33.6, Sprach und Literature, Allgemeines zur Literature des 2. Jarunderts und Einzeln Autoren der Trajanischen und Fruadrianischen Zeit. 
edited by Wolfgang Haas, 4616-23. Berlin and New York, Walter de Gruyter. Gill, Christopher, 1983. The Question of Character Development, Plutarch and Tacitus. Classical Quarterly 33. Number 2 to 469-87. Humble, Noreen, ed. 2010. Plutarch's Lives, Parallelism and Purpose. Swansea, Classical Press of Wales. McInerney, Jeremy, 2003. Plutarch's Manly Women. In Andrea, Studies in Manliness and Courage in Classical Athens. Edited by Ralph M. Rosen and Aneke Sluter, 319-44. Nemozine, Bibliotheca Classica Batava, Supplementum 238. Leiden, The Netherlands, and Boston, Brill. Mossman, Judith, 2015. Dressed for Success? Clothing in Plutarch's Demetrius. In Fame and Infamy, Essays for Christopher Pelling on Characterization and Roman Biography and Historiography. Edited by Rhiannon Ash, Judith Mossman, and Francis B. Titchener, 149-60. Oxford, Oxford Univ. Press. Nicolaitis, Anastasios G., ed. 2008. The Unity of Plutarch's Work, Moralia Themes in the Lives, Features of the Lives in the Moralia. Berlin and New York, Walter de Gruyter. Pelling, Christopher, 2002. Plutarch and History, 18 Studies. Swansea, Classical Press of Wales. Scardilly, Barbara, ed. 1995. Essays on Plutarch's Lives. Oxford, Clarendon. Stater, Philip, 1996. Anecdotes and the Thematic Structure of Plutarchian Biography. In Estudios Sobra Plutarco, Aspectos Formales, Actas del IV Symposio Español Sobra Plutarco, Salamanca, 26 a 28 de Mayo de 1994. Edited by José Antonio Fernández Delgado and Francisca Portomingo Pardo, 291-303. Madrid, Ediciones Clásicas. 2015. The Rhetoric of Virtue in Plutarch's Lives. In Plutarch and His Roman Readers. By Philip A. Stater, 231-45. Oxford, Oxford Univ. Press. Wardman, Alan E. 1967. Description of Personal Appearance in Plutarch and Suetonius, the Use of Statues as Evidence. Classical Quarterly 17, No. 2 420 20. Zadoroini, Alexei V. 2012. Mimesis and the PLU Past in Plutarch's Lives. In Time and Narrative in Ancient Historiography, the Plupast from Herodotus to Appian. Edited by Jonas Grethlein and Christopher B. Krebs, 175-98. Cambridge, UK, Cambridge Univ. Press. Topic. External links Plutarch's works Works by Plutarch at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Plutarch at Internet Archive Works by Plutarch at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Perseus Project, many texts of Plutarch and Pseudo-Plutarch in Greek and English Dido edition of Plutarch's works in Greek, with Latin translation 1857-1876, Volume 1 Lives, pt. 1, Volume 2 Lives, pt. 2, Volume 3 Moralia, pt. 1, Volume 4 Moralia, pt. 2, Volume 5 Fragmenta et Spuria also via BNF Collections of works in English translation, at University of Adelaide, at Lacuscursius, Project Gutenberg, Lives, Trans. North PDF Also in English translation by John Dryden, 1631 to 1700, Plutarch, Parallel Lives, Solon Free audiobooks by Plutarch from LibriVox Secondary Material Caramanolis, George. Plutarch. In Zalta, Edward N. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Plutarch of Chaeronea by Jonah Lendering at Livius. Org The International Plutarch Society The Relevance of Plutarch's Book De Defectu Oraculorum for Christian Theology Plauterchos, Journal of the International Plutarch Society